Hallelujah. So today we will be talking on a title I call Loving One Another. Say to one another, Loving One Another. In the last three weeks, and the first week, we talked about being rooted in God's love. In other words, we talked about God's love for us. And we say that God's love for us is the foundation of Christianity. All right. And then in the third week, the third installment, we talked about our love for God. And we said that loving God is not based on our feeling. God says that in his word, if you love me, what? Obey my commandments. And so a love for God is not based on emotions. A love for God is not based on the scriptures that you know. A love for God is based on obedience to his command. So God's love language is obeying his command. However, we said that until we receive the love of God, we cannot love God because the Bible says we love him because he first loved us. But today we're going to be talking about not just loving God. You can't truly say you love God and hate your brother. No, it can't work like that. Loving God must also translate in loving people. Say loving God must translate to loving people. So I want us to quickly look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20 and 21. 1 John chapter 4, verse 20 and 21. Let's read together. Let's read NKJV version. It says, if someone says, I love God, right, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he, what? Love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. So the Bible is saying here that you cannot say, if you see somebody who says, I love you, Jesus, I love you, God, but hates his brother, he says the person is a liar. That you can't truly say you love God without actually loving people. Loving God must translate to loving people. Is that not what the Bible says? I mean, let's quickly look at 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. I want us to look at something. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8. Let's read together. What does he say? He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So here it is telling us that how much you know God must be reflected in how much you love people. A lot of people can say, this person knows God, knows God. And if you notice the person's love work, and that the person's love work is not, the person is not loving people, the person doesn't know God. Did you hear that? Let's read again. Let's read that scripture. What does it say? He who does not love, does not know God. Why? For God is love. You cannot know God without knowing that God is love. God does not have love. God is love. His very nature is the nature of love. Am I making sense? His very nature, his very image, his very likeness is the likeness of love. I want us to go back to the beginning and let us trace how we got here as a people and what God expects of us. The Bible says in the beginning that God made who? Man and woman. Let's look at Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. Let's read together. What does he say? Then God said, let us make man uh -huh, according to our image. What's the image of God? Love. Uh -huh. According to our likeness. Uh -huh, and let them have dominion. That tells me something. God wants to give dominion to somebody who has his image. Did you hear that? Before he made man to have dominion, what did he give man? His image. He made man in the image of love. That tells me something. In God's mind, if he wants to make somebody a president, somebody to have rulership and authority, right? What will God be looking at? He'll be looking at somebody who represents his image and that's the image of love. If God wants to make a man the head of a woman, a husband, 
What will God be looking at before he brings that rulership and authority? He looks at his image. And what's his image? His image is love. Do you know why it is important to look at the image of love? Do you know why it's important? It's important because in marriage, for example, what marriage is, is that God is handing a woman, his own daughter, under the rulership or headship of a man. Is that not true? And imagine if that man does not have the image of love, rather that man oppresses. It means that God is wicked to hand that person over. Is that not true? And that's why you see here in this scripture, God made man in his image, then he said, let them have dominion. Am I making sense here? You will notice that the way God has designed this world, it's impossible, yes, for everything to work well without love. I will tell you what I mean. If you notice in a family, for example, two people can be born of the same mother and the same father, but you notice that they have different abilities, different talents. Is that not true? Even in a, in a family a, where there's a husband and a wife, you notice that the woman has relational abilities that the man does not have. I don't know whether you understand that. The woman has nurturing abilities, can nurture, nurse a child that a man doesn't necessarily have. Right? And the man has strength. Strength to work. Strength to carry things that a woman doesn't have. And so, everything God has designed, every institution he has designed, he has designed that it works by love. The reason why it's designed that way because he has put things in different people that each person needs. And so, if they do not operate in love, then people will be deprived of certain resources he has put in others. I don't know whether you understand my point. For example, let's look at it from a, a, on a bigger scale. If you look at nations, if you look at certain nations, there are certain nations that do not necessarily have a lot of natural resources than other nations, but they have services, they have some other things in them. There are some um, nations that have oil, they don't have other things like coal, they may not have cocoa, they may not have cotton. There are other nations that have, they have the number, they have the manpower, but they don't have certain resources. They have to depend on each other in order to what? To live in harmony. Think about it. There are some nations that are stronger than others. People call the United States the world power. Is that not true? So the United States seems to have dominion. Imagine if the United States was led by a man who is an oppressor. What do you think will happen in this world? They can decide to go to a nation and oppress that nation. They answer to no one. Is that not true? And that is why it's important that you see that God created this world in such a way that if this world must work well, it must work in love. Because we do not all have things equally. This love of God is not created to work in sameness. This love has been created to work in diversity. So many people are saying that there are many tribes in my country, for example, in certain nations, there are several tribes. It's almost impossible for us to work as one. Do you know what is missing? Love. People are saying that when they want to get married, I want to marry somebody that's of my own tribe, somebody that we, ha we have the same intellectual capability, somebody that we have the same background. Everybody is saying that because they want to make it easier for them to love. But God has not created love to work that way. Love works in diversity. You don't have to speak the same language to work in love. That's what happened in the Tower of Babel. The Bible says they spoke the same language. And then, therefore, they decided to build something. What God did to confuse them was just to give them different languages. As soon as they had different languages, guess what? Everybody went apart. But if there was love, it wouldn't have happened. Because love thrives even more when there is diversity. So in the beginning, this was how God wanted the world to work. In his image. And his image is the image of what? Love. How many of you have what things fall apart? Things fall apart. But things fell apart, really. When did things fall apart in the world? Let's look at Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 and 17. Let's read it again. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden you may freely eat, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, what? You shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it, you shall what? 
you shall what? Surely die. You shall what? Surely die. So you notice here, one of the things that happened to man was that man disobeyed this command. And when man disobeyed that command, what happened to them? The word die, man died. But man did not die physically. The life of God went out of man. Man died spiritually. There was no connection in our spirits with God. I'm going somewhere. It's very important that you understand this. But John chapter 3, verse 14 to 16. Let's quickly read. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have, but have, but have, yes, verse 16. For God so loved the world, aha, uh -huh, his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have. Before this happened, when Adam sinned, what happened to Adam when he sinned? He died. But there was something that you notice happened to Adam. Before Adam sinned, Adam and his wife, their marriage was working. There was no argument. There was always agreement between Adam and his wife. As soon as they died spiritually, Adam began to blame his wife for what happened. Is that not true? Then immediately after that, do you know what happened? Cain and Abel, Cain killed his brother. So you see what happened as a result of death. Automatically, when death came, hatred came. When death came, envy came. When death came, all sorts of vices came. And that's why today, you see, today, there are some families that are torn apart. Brothers and sisters are not talking to each other. In fact, they are against each other, fighting each other. I hope you know that today. It came from this death. Cain and Abel. Cain killing his brother. When divorces and marriage, the division that you see in marriage today came as a result of that death. But something happened when Jesus came. In John chapter 3, verse 16, what did Jesus bring? I'm asking somebody. What did Jesus bring according to this verse? He brought eternal life. What happened to Adam when he sinned? He died. But when Jesus came, he brought life. Eternal life. Eternal life does not mean living forever. Eternal life in the Greek word is called zoe, zoa. It means God's kind of life. God's quality of life. That's what it means. When you believe in Jesus and get born again, phew, that death ceases and life comes into your spirit. The life of God comes into your spirit. Right? Do you know why it's important to have that life of God in your spirit? Let's look. First John chapter 3 and verse 14 to 15. Let's read together. First John chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. Let's read together. Let's read. We know that we have passed from, 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 to. How many of us have died before? He's saying we know we have passed from death. How many of us have died before? When we're born into this world, we're born in a state of death. Did you hear that? Spiritual death. So here he's saying we have passed from death. So how do we pass from death to life? When we became born again, we pass from death to life automatically. Notice what the Bible did not say. We are not passing from death to life. Did you hear that? What does it mean? If I said we are passing from death to life, what does that mean? It means that it's something continuous. But this said, we passed. It means that it's something that happened automatically when we gave our life to Christ. Is that correct? Then let's read together. Uh-huh. Because, 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 so you see, as soon as life came, what came with it? Love. As soon as life enters you, what has entered you? Love. Did you hear that? As soon as life has come, what has entered you? As soon as life has come, what has entered you? Love. Did you hear that? Let's read together. Uh -huh. Let's read. He who does not love his brother does what? Abide in. So the Bible is saying here, there are two sets of people. One is a person that has passed from death to life. 
two is a person that is still in death. Somebody who is still in death. Right? Now, the problem with this scripture is that some Christians, right, are walking in hatred towards their brother. Is that not true? Some Christians walk in hatred towards their brother. But the Bible is saying, what does the Bible say? He who does not love his brother does what? Abides in death. Whoever hates his brother, including his mother-in-law, whoever hates his mother-in-law or his father-in-law is a murderer. Tell somebody, if you hate your mother-in-law, you are a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Although Christians have passed from death to life, you can still choose to walk in hatred. But it doesn't mean that you are back in death. No, it just simply means that externally you are just dwelling there. You are just abiding in death. You shouldn't because you have the life of God in you. You have the love of God in you if you are a Christian. Am I making sense here? I'm going somewhere. So, how many of us know that there is a difference between, I mean, loving somebody and liking somebody? Is there a difference between love and like? Because in the world, people think that love is like. Liking has to do with feeling, having pleasure in, enjoying somebody. Is that not true? Liking has to do with emotions, with the feeling. But the love of God, on the other hand, does not initially have to do with feeling. Because you can love somebody you don't like. Did you get that? You can love somebody who you don't like. The Bible does not say like your enemies. It says love. Hello, knock, knock. You can love somebody who you do not like. Let me say it again. There is a difference between love and like. You can love somebody who you do not like. Like has to do with emotions. Something that you have pleasure in. Somebody, something that you enjoy. But love, on the other hand, does not necessarily have to have emotions to be loved. I'm talking about the God kind of love now. We need to know that there is a difference between natural love and the God kind of love. Hello? For example, there is a natural love that a mother has towards their child. Is that true? There is a natural love that a man, a young man, has towards a young lady, a beautiful young lady. Is that not true? Natural love. There's a natural love between siblings, a brother and a sister. Say, you're my blood. There's a natural love. Is that not true? Then there's a natural love between friends. Because the kind of love between friends is not the same thing as the kind of love between brother and brother. And it's not the same kind of love between a man and a young maiden. And it's not the same kind of love between a mother and the child. Is that not true? These things are natural love. In other words, it is not the exclusive truth of a believer. All human beings have natural love. And a lot of times, believers have not been able to differentiate between natural love and a God kind of love. The problem with natural love is that natural love has its limits. Natural love is selfish. And natural love, at some point, can easily end in hatred. You look at one of the, the kind of love. Let's look at, um, I'll show you some natural love between a man and a woman. Second Samuel chapter 13, 2 to 4, and then 14 to 15, quickly. Are you there? Let's read together. Amnon was so distressed over his sister Tamar, that, that's his half-sister, that he became sick, for she was a virgin, and it was improper for Amnon to do anything to her. For Amnon had a friend whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimei, David's brother. Now Jonadab was a very crafty man, and he said to him, Why are you, the king's son, becoming thinner every, day after day? Will you not tell me? Amnon said to him, let's read together. I love Tamar. He used the word love. I love Tamar. 
What kind of love is this? Erotic love is a love between a young man and a young girl, right? He called it love. But I want you to see what happened afterwards. He said, I love Tama, my brother Absalom's sister. However, he would not heed her voice. And being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. So he raped her. And then what happened? Verse 15. Then Amnon, I thought he said, I loved her. What just happened now? He says, then Amnon, what? Hated her exceedingly so that the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. And Amnon said to her, arise, be gone. Get out of my house. So you see here that each of these natural love I have just mentioned can easily turn into hatred. I've been in a, a situation where I've been invited to weddings and I've witnessed weddings. And these guys, when you look at them, man, they, are, they look like love birds. As in they are, I mean, when you see them, they are all sweet. Sweet. And in less than five years, in fact, some less than three years, uh, I mean, they are fighting each other. I mean, I know of different divorces. They have gone to court and they are nasty towards each other in terms of custody of children. They are nasty. And you just wonder, is it not the same people that profess love for one another? When they were professing love for each other, it was erotic love. It was natural love. But the problem with natural love is that it has its limits. It's selfish in nature and can easily turn into hatred. Let's look at another natural love. Second Kings chapter 6. Second Kings chapter 6, verse 25 to 29. I'm going to read the NLT version. Are you there? Let's read together. As a result, there was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 pieces of silver and a cup of dove's dung sold for five pieces of silver. One day, as the king of Israel was walking along the wall of the city, a woman called to him, please help me, my lord, the king. He answered, if the Lord doesn't help you, what can I do? I have neither food from the threshing floor nor wine from the press to give you. But then the king asked, what is the matter? She replied, this woman said to me, come on, let's eat your son today. Then we will eat my son tomorrow. So we cooked my son and ate him. Then the next day, I said to her, kill your son so we can eat him. But she had eaten her son. I want to understand that. Do you think this woman who boiled her son loved her son initially? Do you think she hated her son? Oh, what did a natural love for your son suddenly turn into survival for you. You know what some parents do? Some parents use their children as investment for their own future. Natural love. Natural love is selfish in nature. It's selfish. It's selfish. Because natural love is something about, it's about you. You. You may not know it. You may be showing it, but deep inside, natural love is driven by selfishness. Is driven by selfish. So some parents, I mean, they don't even care if their children are surviving. Not that they don't care. They care that they are surviving for their own sake so that you'll be sending them money so that their lives will be good. So in this case, this woman loved her son naturally until famine came where none of them could afford to eat. There was nothing to eat. Things were expensive. Imagine a loaf of bread being a thousand pounds. Things were expensive. How could they feed? The only thing they could do was to eat their children. And this woman surrendered her child to be eaten. So natural love can easily turn into hatred. Why? Because it's selfish in nature. Natural love has limits. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43 to 48. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Quickly, quickly, quickly. Matthew 5, 43 to 48. Let's read together. You have heard the law that says, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. In that way, you will be acting as true children of your father in heaven. For he gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends his rain on the just and on the unjust alike. 
if you love only those who love you, what reward is there for that? Even corrupt tax collectors do that much. If you are kind only to your friends, how are you different from anyone else? Even pagans do that. But you are to be perfect even as your father in heaven is perfect. So natural love, this is how natural love works. Pastor D, please come. If Pastor D loves me, if Pastor D loves me, I can love him. But the day Pastor D hates me, that's how a natural love has ended. Natural love cannot love somebody that hates him. But once you are still good and loving, that's why marriages collapse. Marriages collapse is that mm, as long as things are fine, the person is behaving well to you. You guys love it, love it. There's love, isn't it? The day this guy keeps annoying you, oh my God, that feeling of I love you, I love you, I love you, just suddenly goes away. And then the feeling of hatred or anger just suddenly comes. Irritation. But if you don't understand the love of God, that thing can break your marriage. The only thing that causes marriage to stand or relationships, I mean, please see that, or relationships to endure is the practice of agape love. I mean, the love of God. Trust me, even in your family, your brother or your sister will annoy you. How many of you have been annoyed by your brother or sister? How many of you have felt like cutting them off? Many times you feel like cutting them off, right? Now, but once you have the love of God, the love of God does not cut people off like that. It's the love of God that glues families together. It's the love of God that binds relationships together. It's the love of God that holds marriages together. It's not human love that holds marriages together. It's the love of God. Am I making sense? It's the love of God, not human love. So if as a Christian, you have not learned to practice the love of God, yes, marriage will be hard for you. Did you hear me? If as a Christian, you don't know how to practice the love of God, how the love of God works, marriage will be very difficult. It's not a curse. But it's just that you're marrying somebody different from you. You're marrying somebody from a different background. You're marrying somebody with different proclivities, different inclinations, different desires, different expectations, different, different, different. <laughs> Until you understand how to practice the love of God. That's why at times, when God leaves you in a relationship where somebody, I mean, maybe among friends who keep annoying you over time, and God is expecting you to begin to stretch in love. God wants you to stretch in love, in your love capacity. But a lot of people run away from those kind of people. I mean, but the problem is that with marriage, it binds you together like a co covenant. But people, even with that divorce, people break out, break out of it. Do you understand? Marriage is a place where you can actually practice love and make sure you don't, you don't check out because you still have a choice to check out. So Jesus is saying here that what separates the boys from the men, what separates the unbeliever from the believer is loving your enemies. Because the natural love cannot cross that boundary. Natural love cannot cross the boundary of loving his enemies. So it's only agape love. Something that is not swelled from your strength is swelled by God. That is the only thing that can love your, your, your enemies. And what I'm saying in essence, as Christians, we have this love on the inside of us that has the capability to love our enemies. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. Romans chapter 5, verse 6 to 8. Let's quickly look at the law of God kind of law that we've been talking about. Let's read together. When we're utterly helpless, Christ came at just the right time and died for us sinners. Now, most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though someone might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while, while we were still his enemies, Christ died. Can you imagine that? Somebody that has offended you. Somebody has offended you and you are sacrificing for that person. You're sacrificing your salary so that that person will be fine. The person has offended you. The Bible says that God loved us while we were still sinners. That love that God has is what he has put inside every Christian. The ability to love people when they are unlovely. The ability to love people when we think they are undeserving of our love. 
Am I making sense? Some people have half brothers, half sisters, right? Because of the way your stepmother has treated you when you were growing up, you suddenly developed hatred towards the kids, right? And God is saying, come on, his love breaks such boundaries. His love breaks such boundaries, yes? They're not your brothers. They're not your stepbrothers or stepsisters. Does it mean that you don't love them? God's love breaks such boundaries. He says, while we were still sinners, he says, God demonstrated his love towards us. So let's really look at the characteristics of love. Everybody, you know we're going to read 1 Corinthians 13, don't you? 1 Corinthians 13, and let's look at verse, I'm going to just pick one or two or three, and then we'll just take a testimony, and then that's it for the day. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 4 to 8. Let's read together. This is the definition of love. Love what? Suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not behave rudely. Love does not seek its own. Love is not provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they would fail. Whether there are tongues, they will see. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. So I want us to look at the first point. It says, love suffers long and it's kind. One of the characteristics of love is that it says, love suffers long and is kind while suffering long. Did you hear that? Because there is an and there. Love suffers long and is kind. What does long suffering mean? What does long suffering mean? Let me give you the definition of long suffering according to the Vines Dictionary, Expository Dictionary. Listen, it says, long suffering is the quality of self restraint in the face of provocation, which does not hastily retaliate or promptly punish. Let's um, give a real life example. A real life example is that. You are married, and then the husband that you married, for example, throws his socks a certain way. He's not used to, women are normally tidier than men, right? I mean, he's not used to putting his socks where he's supposed to be. So he wakes up, maybe after going out, he throws his socks aside somewhere. He leaves it somewhere. And then you keep telling him, why are you putting these socks here? Can you please put it well, right? Sometimes he remembers to put it well, and sometimes he does not remember to put it well. But every time you come and you see that that socks is not put well, as a person, it causes provocation. I said, and you go again and say, did I not say that you should? I've been telling you this over and over again. Is that not true? That's what some people say. I've been telling you this over and over again. But what we don't know is that it takes time for somebody who has been schooled for, who has been groomed for many years in a certain direction to change. Is that not true? It takes time to change. Therefore, if it takes time to change, you ought to be able to suffer long till they change and be kind while doing that. So you endure and not be a nag. Knock, knock. Am I dialing someone's number? Right? And not be a nag. The Bible says that you suffer long and be kind. So many of us, that means that when I'm suffering long, I don't withdraw some benefits from the object of my suffering long. Is that not true? Because in marriage, some men can use, let's say they are the breadwinner of the family. They withdraw some privileges. Some women, because they are, in quotes, custodians of sex, they withdraw sex. Some people will, I mean, while they are suffering long, they are giving you silent treatment. What's wrong? Silent treatment. And then the other party is prostrated. But the Bible says this is the quality of love. That love suffers long and is kind while suffering long. It's something that we need to practice. So when we're talking about long suffering, long suffering actually overlooks people's faults. You overlook people's faults. You forbear. That's what the Bible says. Let's look at the next scripture. I mean, Romans chapter 3 verse 25 about God's long suffering. Let's read. Whom God set forth 
as a propitiation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness. Because what? What? In his forbearance, what did he do? God had passed over the sins that were previously cruel. So in other words, God was seeing people committing sins, 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 sins. But because of his long suffering and forbearance, he ignored it as if there was no sin. I don't know whether you understand my point. So in long suffering, there's a covering of multitude of sins. Somebody's offending you, offending you. Not the one that you're keeping record of it, because we'll soon see that love does not keep account of the evil done to it. Then the next one I want to talk about is, okay, because of time, I'm going to just switch, and we're going to continue. I'm going to switch to the practicals. How do I practically work in love? How do I practically work in love? Or let me put it this way, first and foremost, what are the things that hinder us as Christians to walk in love? Now, these things I'm talking about, you're supposed to practice it. If there's a relationship that you have at the moment that you see that is really hurting you, this is where to apply this message. Or where people are really getting on your nerves, this is where to practice this message. Practice, be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. What are the hindrances? Let me tell you the hindrance to walking in love, at least that I've seen. Number one, the first hindrance to walking in love is ignorance. And I'm going to divide ignorance in two places. What do I mean by ignorance? Number one, people do not know that love is not a feeling. Did you get that? People do not know that love, the agape love of God, is not a feeling. It's a choice. I will tell you why is implications of it. Pastor D, please come. The implications of it, let me tell you the implications of what I'm saying. Pastor D comes and he, he annoys me. Let's say he's done something that has offended me. How would I feel? Huh? I'll feel hurt. But it doesn't stop me from coming and say, oh, Pastor D, are you okay? What do you need? I'm blessing. I am feeling hurt. But my actions are actions of love. I choose to love him in spite of my feeling. If you don't understand that love is not a feeling, you will not be able to act this way in spite of the way you feel. Am I making sense? Because a lot of people will think, eh, I can't change myself, but I'm feeling this way, I can't act. No, that feeling is not you. That feeling that you are feeling is not you. Because who you are is spirit. So you must know that the agape love of God is first and foremost not a feeling. So you don't feel hypocritical when you're acting in love, when you're acting opposite to your feelings, because you've associated the feeling to you. Hey, I'm feeling angry. That, that means I'm angry. That's not true. Ignorance of knowing that love is not a feeling causes people not to be able to walk in this love we're talking about. Although love is not a feeling, love can eventually produce feeling. Did you get that? Should I say it again? Although love is not a feeling, am I saying, I know that I'm feeling this way. As I begin to act in love, my heart may begin to respond towards him in love and begin to feel afterwards, but maybe not before. Is somebody understanding what I'm saying? So number one, Pastor you can see that, the reason why some people do not work in love, number one is ignorance. The first ignorance is not knowing that love is not a feeling. Love is a choice, it's an action. Number two, ignorance. Why do believers not act in love? Because these things can help your marriage and your relationships. Why are they not able to act in love? Number two, ignorance of the fact that the love of God has already been poured inside you. You have the love of God. You have the love of God. Do you get that? I don't think you got that. The Bible says God is love. Are you a child of God? If you're a child of God, it means that you're a child of love. That means you are love. But the you that is love is your spirit. And your spirit is who you are. This is your flesh that at times feels angry with somebody. It's not who you are. So I can act contrary to this feeling because I know who I am. I am love. So I can begin to act in love although my feeling is contrary to my actions. Is somebody understanding my point? So two things, the reason why we, are, we can't practically walk in love is number one, the fact that we are ignorant of the fact that love is not a feeling. 
And then two, the fact that we are ignorant of the fact that we are love. That the love of God has been poured out in us. The fruit of the spirit is love. So our spirit is love. Am I making sense? Then number three. Why is it that Christians find it hard to walk in love? The third point is what I call the flesh. The lust of the flesh. Why do I say that? Because if somebody slaps me without knowing, I turn around and somebody gives me a dirty slap. What's your initial reaction? Huh? Your initial instinct will be you want to why are you slapping me? You want to slap back. That's the initial. That's that's what we call the flesh. The propensity to sin. It's on the outside. It's not inside us. On the outside, because this body is still not redeemed. So if somebody does us evil, that feeling of to so return evil for evil. That's one of the reasons why some people do not walk in love. Because they can't go past that flesh. So, but what is God's remedy? What is God's remedy? I've told you what is God. Number one. Romans, yeah, let's read together. Let's read. If Christ is in you, the body is dead because of sin. That's so this body still responds like as if <laughs> it wants to sin. Am I making sense? Uh-huh. But the spirit is, is happened to Adam. He died. But our spirit is what it means that already in our spirit, love exists. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Verse 11. But if the spirit of him, uh-huh, who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, uh-huh, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. Now, this is the solution. He's telling you that that love you have in your spirit has more power is more powerful than the feelings of your flesh. Did you get that? He's saying that that love, you know when somebody annoys you and feeling hatred? <laughs> he said the love inside your spirit is greater than that hatred. All you need to do is to act it out and you see it's greater. Because the Bible says here that he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal body. In other words, will make your body align. He will give life to your mortal body uh -huh. through his spirit who dwells in you. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh. Ah, that's your feeling of doing evil. To live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. So on the inside of us, God has given us the strength, the power, the love to overcome that feeling of weakness of the flesh. We just need, number one, understand that it's there. Then number two, by faith, exercise it. Did you get that? Number two, by what? Faith, exercise it. Number two, by what? Faith, exercise it. For example, I'll give you an example. I've told you this. Oftentimes, some people just annoy me. <laughs> Oftentimes, people just annoy you. Just by being them, they just annoy you. <laughs> but... Okay, I've told you this story about somebody who says something about me that I heard. Someone who had helped that said something about me that I heard that I, that I cried and my flesh was saying, do you know what, just deal with this person. All you just need to do is just release something about that person and then the person is finished. And somebody will say, Pastor, yes, we all have our flesh. We all have the same flesh. Hello? We all have the flesh that has the propensity for evil. Is that not true? Have you not heard pastors committing adultery? And you're wondering, I didn't know pastors. It's because it's the same flesh. But you ought to learn how to master the flesh through the spirit. So I lay down there. What did I do? Because I, I felt weak to love that person. So what I wanted to do, because I know that the Bible says through the spirit, you put to death. So I needed something that will stir up the spirit. Am I making sense? Because in my mind, my mind was full of hatred. So I need something in me that will stir up the spirit. You know what I did? I started playing worship. So I began to play worship. I lay in my bed. I was listening to worship, 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 listening to... That was in the beginning when I was practicing these things. Now it's not like that. Listening to worship, listening to worship. As I was listening to worship, in between that worship, 
the Holy Spirit just reminded me of a book that I read, something about that situation. So I got up, went to my library, picked up that book. As I opened the book to read, I suddenly saw what the devil was trying to do, put two heads together. And all of a sudden, that, ooh, that made me feel good now because what? Perspective has changed. Spirit has come. How does the Spirit help us? He helps us through understanding. He brings understanding. He reminds us of something. That reminding provides us a way to be able to act out the word. Am I making sense? So when that thing started happening, I sent that person a text. I said, God will bless you. But someone was saying, is that not being hypocritical? No. Because love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Did you hear that? So I sent that person and said, God will bless you. I'm praying for you. You will do well in your life. So what I do I was practicing who I was, love. Although my feeling was still feeling hatred towards that person. I ignored my feeling because my feeling is not me and love is not a feeling. Am I making sense? And as soon as I kept doing that, the power of God came on me. That life on the inside of me now came out to swallow the feeling of hatred. But you must act first, not based on your feeling. You act based on your knowing. Say somebody, you act based on your knowing. You act based on spiritual understanding. You act based on what the Holy Spirit is giving you, reminding you of. Because that gives you motion. You begin to act, then the Holy Spirit comes alongside you, and then the love of God gushes out. But you must not think that love is a feeling. Because if you think that love is a feeling, you'll be waiting until you feel good. I may never come.